Welcome back, Chooms. Today, we're going to jack back into the cyberpunk genre with a review of Cyberpunk Red. Let's dive in. Here we have the Cyberpunk Red Core Rulebook, the role-playing game of the dark future. And this was published by Artalsorian Games um, back in October of 2020, if I'm not mistaken. And so this was, of course, backed by CD Projekt Red as well, the creators of Cyberpunk uh, 2077, which came out earlier in 2021. So as soon as you open it up, you're going to get this really awesome spread for the inside cover. I really love this. Like it just sets the whole tone of what this book is going for. And like seriously, I just take this and put it as my desktop of wallpaper. Same with the back cover, inside cover. Just just so cool. I really like that. A couple things about the overall layout of the book. Um so <laughs> I actually found it really hard to reference things just based on the chapter titles alone. The chapter titles, they don't really give you a whole lot of information. So for example, Soul and the New Machine, that you wouldn't be able to really tell that that's the chapter on classes and roles and stuff like that. So all of the titles are kind of abstract in the actual titles themselves. You'd actually have to read the subheadings to see what is actually in that chapter. But the book also does a really good job of referencing with page numbers. Like if you really want to learn more about the different classes, it'll give you those page numbers quite soon. So the very first chapter that we have is entitled Never Fade Away. or And this is actually a story. So there are a few different stories spread out throughout this book. And they kind of give you the flavor of what this, what cyberpunk is and about some of the lore. So Never Fade Away actually is one of the lore pieces. So if you're a really big fan of Cyberpunk 2077, then this would be a really good read because it just gives you some of the lore of what happens before you actually get into 2077. So definitely worth an option. I'm not really going to go in too much depth about those stories, but I will kind of mention them when we get there. So the first real chapter that I will definitely mention is a View from the Edge, or as I like to call it, Cyberpunk 101. This is what I would call the introduction chapter. Practically every book has one, and they throw the, mon the most mundane crap in, like, what is an RPG, and how was it played, and I find these chapters to be quite useless, even for people who have never played an RPG before. Well, I mean, there's a few exceptions, but this is, this is actually going to be one of the exceptions. Hear me out. So, as soon as you open up this chapter, you are greeted by information that is quite pertinent. These would be the chapter headings that I would really like. So, for example, you, if you want to know more about cyberware, then skip to page 107. You want to know about Neocore? Then go to page 264. How about Night City? You want to know what you, what kind of city you're going to be playing in? Then go to page 283. It actually gives you information. And it also gives you information about the genre and the universe. So, what happened in the Fourth Corporate War and why is this the time of the Red? It gives you a little bit of information, just a tease because further on in the book, you're going to get a lot more information. And so you get a few pages of those little headings that direct new players to pertinent chapters or places where they would like to go. And then of course you do have that mundane crap like, how does an RPG work? What is a character? How do you GM? But a, a section that I really did enjoy that I'm glad is in here is the section on street slang. So this is stuff that these are just basically um, vocabulary for the cyberpunk universe. So, Beavervilles, Boosters, Combat Drugs, uh, Lawman, what are those things? Those are actually defined here. So, really interesting read. Kind of wish they had a Chumba in here, but they don't. But oh well. 
I mean, you're going to get that flavor anyways. And spread out throughout this book, you're also going to get these really weird little advertisements. I actually find those quite entertaining. And some of them are actually uh, copyrighted by CD Projekt Red. Um, they have that mentioned here at the beginning of the book. So it's, I actually really find it quite funny to read through those. So anyways, the next chapter is actually going to be Soul and the New Machine. Or as I like to call it, Class Selection. Or as it should be in the book, Role Selection. I want to take a quick mention about the artwork in this book itself. Everything here is top-notch. Like, there isn't a single piece of art in this entire book that I just don't like. I love every single thing. And the really cool thing about it is they actually give credit where credit's due. They mention the illustrator in every single piece uh, that is actually in this book. Aside from the parts that were actually uh, copyrighted by CD Projekt Red that was done by that specific company. So we have Soul in the New Machine or Role Selection. So there are 10 different roles. You have Rocker Boys, Solos, Netrunners, Techs, Med Techs, Medias, Execs, Lawmen, Fixers, and Nomads. And they each play a little bit differently. So for example, Rocker Boys, they're kind of like your celebrity influencers who can use their charisma to influence others and gain fans. And they all of these different roles have a specific role ability. So that's what the Rocker Boy is able to do with their role ability. It's called charisma charismatic impact. Whereas the solos, they're your, more of your standard warrior class, but they get something called combat awareness, which gives them special buffs when they go into combat. Netrunners, uh, these are your hackers. They are the people that you're going to need if you want to interface and do net runs. So that's what their role ability actually allows them to do. Not anybody can just go ahead and interface. We have techs who are the mechanics and engineers. They are really good at modifying and inventing things with their special ability. Med techs are the medics of the game, go figure, and they are the only role allowed to spec points into skills like surgery, pharmaceuticals, and uh, cryo systems. So you need to actually be a med tech to spec some points into those, and those are basically like your healing uh, skills right there. Then you have medias. Medias are the people of the world who want to expose corruption and basically stick it to the man. Their role ability allows them to uh, convince people of their truth or of their point of view. Then you have execs. These are the fancy people who work for corporations internally. Their role ability gives them access to team members, which are NPCs that you actually create, and they have their they have their own jobs and stats and everything. So you're basically controlling like a whole team worth of people, but your exec is going to be your main character. Then you have lawmen, and these are police officers who can actually call for backup with their role ability. Just don't abuse it, or you could get fired. Then you have fixers. Fixers are like your Mr. Johnsons from that other game about the dark future, but with magic. They are able to find things and even set up special night markets where you can buy equipment that you might not find on your everyday shop. And then last but not least, you have your nomads, and these are like your Mad Maxes of the universe. The, they, these people are really good with vehicles, and with their role ability, they can actually uh, procure a vehicle from their nomad family, or they can actually upgrade their different vehicles within their garage, which is really cool. Um, the last few pages actually detail how to create a character. So there's actually three methods of creating a character, and I've done videos for two of those methods. Um, you can create a character using the street rat method, the edge red redder method, or the complete package, which actually gives you complete control over like where you're putting your stats or points and stats and skills and stuff like that. The others are kind of like set, but you roll for on tables and then you allocate certain numbers to those stats and skills. So you now check out those videos if you want more of a tutorial on how to create a character. But I was really thankful for these two pages because they give you the steps and they also give you the page numbers on where to go to actually find that information. So really cool. That is great organizational. Really awesome. 
And then, of course, our next chapter is Tales from the Street. Or, as I like to call it, deciding what your backstory is before the good stuff. This is the chapter that is all about your character's life path or their backstory. Uh, within this chapter, you get a series of questions to kind of help you figure out what happened to them before they got to this point. This is really cool because your backstory actually plays a heavy part in gameplay and the whole narrative of whatever game your GM decides to run. So you have questions like, what do you like? What's your personality like? What kind of clothing do you wear? What are you never without? Uh, what's your family like? Where do they come from? So you can actually either roll on these tables or you could create your own. Um, the tables are really good for those who aren't really good at creating backstories or who haven't had that experience before. They can just look here and pick things that actually apply to them and stuff like that. And after you answer these general questions, you actually get role-based life paths for 10 different roles. So if you're a rocker boy, you're going to get even more things to go on on the rocker boy page. So you will actually find your role, um, go through the questions, and add that stuff in. And my only real gripe with this one is that medias get one page. Let me find it real quick. Medias get one page, as do the rocker boys. But this actually really makes it weird if you are an exec who has to flip back and forth between the different tables for whatever reason. But it does kind of get fixed right here with the lawman and then you have two pages for fixers. I just kind of wish that they all had two pages worth. And then mm -mm, we get some pro kibble, another advert right here before we get to fitted for the future, or as I like to call it, dumpeth, dumping everything else into one chapter. This is a big chapter in terms of information. And to me, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense why these are all grouped into one chapter. So hear me out. First, you get stats. They, there are details for determining your stats for whichever method you use. You're either going to roll a d10 and then use that array across, or you're going to roll multiple d10s for each of your stats, or you're just going to allocate points. And you're going to have set points, and then you're just going to uh, basically allocate numbers to each of those stats. And that's the complete package right there. Uh, there are 10 different stats. You have intelligence, reflex, dexterity, tech, cool, will, luck, move, body, and empathy. And so the book definitely makes it very clear that not all stats are equal. Some are definitely more, are more valuable than others. You can definitely take a look at the skills to kind of get a better view of that. And speaking of skills, there are a ton of them. Uh, they are grouped in together by uh, different sections. So you have your awareness skills, which encompasses concentration, conceal slash reveal object, lip reading, perception, and tracking, and it just keeps going on and on. And if you've seen the character sheet for Cyberpunk Red, yeah, there's just one page and it's just all skills right there. So like two thirds of this page is just skills. And that can be pretty daunting. But luckily there's a nice section right here that tells you what those skills do and what stat those are allocated to. I really do like that the skills are varied, that even if two people pick the same role, they can still spec out their characters in completely different ways and be just good at something else. So you might have somebody who's really good at talking to people and then somebody else who's good at fixing things, you know. There's two different methods of giving skills during creation, character creation that is. You can either take the list from the roles, which are located on page 86 and 87, or if you want complete control, you're just going to take the basic skills. These are skills that everybody has to have at least two points in, and then you'll pick the rest of your skills. That can be pretty daunting for new players because there's a lot of skills. And so what I've actually done in my uh, complete package video, I actually kind of took some inspiration and then went from there. And then of course you're going to be allocating points because you're going to have set number of points. You're going to have you're going to have 86 
skill points to distribute between any number of skills that you take, and none of them can be below uh, level two. And so what you do with those skills, so let's say that I'm taking uh, concentration and I have that as a level two skill, and then my stat for that, for my will is three, I'm gonna take those two numbers and add them together and that becomes my base uh, for that skill. So what I would do, I would take my five and roll a d10 and I would add five to that roll and that would determine whether or not I succeed or fail. So everything is done with the level of that skill plus stat plus one d10, so those three numbers. And that would be your actual skill roll. Um, that's basically how everything is set up in this book. So it's a nice little formula that you can keep track of. It isn't too complicated. It doesn't give you this formula and then, oh, well, here's, the, here's a different formula for this situation and this situation. It's all basically the same formula, which I'm very thankful for. Even though there's a lot of different mechanics in this book, it's, it does a really good job of keeping things set within that formula. So that's stats and those are skills. And then immediately right after, we get into our gear. Okay, so we have melee weapons, armor, and ranged weapons. The problem that I have with this section of this book is that you get all of this information later in the book. <laughs> so everything here, yeah, that's fine, but you're gonna get the same information later in the book and you're actually going to get more of it so i just don't really see why that we have to have this section here when it's just repeated again and that's that's the same thing with a lot of the information in this book you're going to get some information here but it's just going to get repeated later down the line um, and it's actually going to be its own chapter there's a, actually a whole chapter just for equipment so why this section is here the equipment section is here tagged along at the end of this chapter it just really doesn't make any sense to me so, needless to say, for your character's creation's sake, you can actually pick a loadout. That's what your role, your class role will get. Or you can just actually use Eurobucks to buy things. And you'll get like 2,550 Eurobucks to spend. And then you'll actually get 800 Eurobucks just for fashion alone, which you're going to need because uh, some of the fashion in this book is actually quite expensive those execs and the luxury people. But yeah, there's actually a lot of gear. And then we get to my absolute favorite section, putting the cyber into cyberpunk, or as I like to call it, the best part of the damn book. This is by far my favorite chapter of the entire book because this is where you actually get cyberware. So you're gonna get an overview of what cyberware is and what cyberpsychosis is because when you get cyberware, you actually sacrifice a little bit of your humanity. And if your humanity gets really, really low, you go batshit crazy. So yeah, don't do that. But there's different categories of cyberware. So for example, we have fashion wear, which is what makes you look pretty. Then you're gonna have neural wear, which aug augments your reflexes and your mental abilities. You have cyber optics, which are like your eyeballs. You're basically replacing your eyeballs for some really cool stuff. Then you have cyber audio, which improves your uh, listening capabilities. You have internal cyberware, which are kind of like organs and can actually make you into a stud. So yeah, then you have external body cyberware, which are things like armor, like skin, and you can actually get like pockets in your skin to store stuff in, which is actually kind of gross when you really think about it. You have cyber limbs, which replace your arms and your legs with options for extra stuff. So like you can have um, blades that come out of your arms and you can just start jabbing people with them. And then you have Borg wear, which is pretty much like replacing your entire body with, to be like an android basically. And yeah. It would pretty much be like, actually like this picture right here. And this guy's basically like Borg where he's got the whole, he's replaced his whole entire body with like a metal suit. So as I said before, every time you take in new cyberware, you actually sacrifice a little bit of humanity to do that. 
and given enough, if, as you take more humanity damage, uh, you run the risk of becoming in, a cyber psycho. So there's also an option for if you need more cash, you can basically sell your soul to either the military, organized crime, or to a corp. And there's always a catch. So they might include, they might actually uh, implant you with a bomb, a remote detonator that can just blow up if you don't do what they do. Or they could hold your family hostage. So yeah, fun things like that. And then we get to the fall of the towers. Uh, this is just another story chapter, which is about the fall of Arasaka Tower uh, for any of those Cyber 2077 lore fanatics out there. This is a really good chapter too, by the way. So I won't go into that, but I will get into chapter 8, which is getting things done, or as I like to call it, how you actually play the game. This chapter explains how skills work in Cyberpunk Red. So, like in every other game, you have on your turn, you get a move action and then you get like a standard action. Uh, so, standard actions are your run of the mill actions that allow you to do things like attack or run away. You can throw things, you can use net actions, use an object or use a skill. Even though this seems like it's about attacking, there's actually a full chapter on combat, so this is kind of a little bit misleading in a way. And this chapter is actually confusing in its own right because it encompasses a wide array of information. Just like chapter 5, I really just, it, it's just a little bit too much. For example, we get the skill list yet again. But this time around, not only do we get the, the skill and, you know, their allocated stats, we actually get a rundown, so like at base 10, uh, let's take a look at uh, lip reading. Um, the skill of reading someone's lip to tell you what they're saying. So at base 10, you've spent enough time snooping on conversations to pick up a few words here and there. At base 14, you can read all sorts of people, including those with heavy accents and partially obscured mouths. At base 18, you could dictate a conversation from 10 meters away through a snowstorm with one eye closed. So it's basically giving you three different tiers of how this skill works. So as you go higher, you're getting more proficient with it. And that's really cool and all. But I think this is it isn't in the right spot. I would have put this in where the skills were way back in chapter five. That way, those people who are actually, you know, building their character can actually see, okay, so this is really what lip reading does and how it correlates into mechanics. Instead of just giving you, okay, this is what lip reading does and here's some fluff text for that. I just, it's, this is just another instance of where something is in its wrong spot, in my opinion. Then we get to the section on roll abilities. That's really cool and all, but again, this isn't in the right spot. This should have been way back during role selection to actually let new players know that, hey, this is what that role does, and as you gain more ranks in it, this is what you get. That way they have a clear understanding of, hey, if I want to be a rocker boy, or do I really want to be an exec? So, you know, giving that giving those new players a chance to see instead of having to flip all the way to like page 143 to see all of that stuff then i i just think that it would have been better served earlier in the book but you do get a lot of really good information here uh, you get a rundown of what each of the ranks for each of the role abilities translates into mechanically so for example the execs uh they get their team member, or they get teamwork, and at rank one, they get a signing bonus. At rank two, they get a corporate housing, but at rank four is when they actually really start getting a team member to play with. And so it gives you um, some options for that said team member, and basically it allows you to create that person with their stats and everything, by the way, and their job. So my only really gripe with this section in and of itself is that layout wise is just a mess. For example, I have credibility, which is the media role ability. So it starts on one page, right? Which is really good. I like that. And then it goes into a second page 
and then it almost goes halfway to a third page, and that's when the exec rollability starts. I really would have preferred if they had just kept things nice and clean, that way I can just turn to the actual page that begins the exec rollability instead of having to look down and see. I am thankful though that there is a nice big red line that shows me, hey, there's a break right here, and that's where the next section starts. But again, layout wise, it's just kind of really messy to look at, especially when, you know, they have nice pictures right here. Why couldn't they just do that right here after the media? So it's just another layout gripe for me. This whole chapter, it was, it's really messy for me. I mean, I'm really appreciative that you get skills and stuff, but I think this section should have been just about rolling skills and combat. That should have been it. Everything else should have been in the book earlier in its appropriate spot during character creation. But I digress. We're going to move on because the next section is Friday Night Firefight. Or as I like to call it, how combat works and everything I just said should have been just like this chapter. This is the section on combat. Rolling skills during combat and attacking and defending and everything that you need to know about that. So on your turn, you get a standard action and a move action. That's pretty much all there is. You do not have to worry about bonus actions, although there are some given actions. I believe like talking is just a free thing that you can do. So when combat actually starts, you're going to roll for initiative. And initiative is a d10 plus reflex. So very simple. Everything revolves around the d10, by the way. Okay, so you rolled that, and now it's time to actually attack. So, let's say that you actually want to attack. Well, for melee attacking, it's just your standard, I believe, 1d10 plus melee or weapons attack um, versus their evasion. Range combat is really interesting. So, first... You need to determine the range at which the target is located. Okay, so there's a nice chart right here. So 0 to 6 meters, 7 to 12, 13 to 25, so it just keeps on going on and on. And then it's got the weapon type, and that is going to be your DV, or the number that you need to roll over, or at or over, to actually succeed. So you're going to take the attacker's reflex plus the relevant weapon skill, plus 1d10. Okay, that's kind of good. And you're going to basically compare it to the DV, depending on the range. So for example, for a pistol, if you're 0 to 6 meters away, your DV is going to be at 13. It can go all the way up to 200 meters, the pistol's maximum range, where the DV is going to be 30. Yeah, you're going to be very unlikely to actually hit at that range. Uh, pistols do not are not going to hit anything above 200 meters, so that's why that information is not available. And then, if the pers the defender actually has a reflex of 8 or higher, they can choose to attempt to dodge your ranged attack instead of um, using the DV that's there. So the defender's DV or sorry, the defender gets to use their dexterity plus their evasion plus 1d10. So that's that's going to be the set DV for the attacker. So yeah, you're either going to use the DV based on range or the DV based on the defender if their reflex is at 8. It's a little bit confusing at first, but once you understand that, it becomes a little bit easier. What I would find highly confusing is actually um, having to remember where everybody is in relation to everything else. And if you're using a map, it'll be a little bit easier. And I'm not sure if you can actually translate roll 20 maps or grids into meters or anything like that. So you're going to have to actually do a little bit of math to convert feet to meters. So there is that a little bit. But, I mean, that's easy. Just Google it. I mean, <laughs> So let's say that you actually hit. Well, every armor has a uh, SP, which is stopping power. Um, stopping power basically stops the damage. But let's say that you actually take some damage because your stopping power is a little bit lower than what you would want. Well, then your actual armor gets less effective. It's actually going to take one point of SP damage. 
So that means it's going to get reduced. So let's say that I have a stopping power of seven with my Kevlar armor and some damage gets through. Well, my Kevlar armor is gonna have a stopping power of six until I get it fixed. So I actually have to do some maintenance on my equipment to keep it up. And the, the, the tech ability kind of makes it, uh, specifies that quite early on that even though that you're um, modifying your equipment and stuff, you're still gonna have to maintain it like every day or else it's gonna get bad. So there's a whole section on uh, vehicle combat as well as all the different uh, skills that you can do like auto fire and stuff like that. All of that is in here, which is actually really cool that there are options for that. I mean, I, it would be pretty sad that if they didn't have at least a pressing fire and auto fire and stuff like that. And there's also information about uh, aiming your shots. So you can actually aim for the head. So if you're not wearing any armor in your head and you take a head shot, that's like three times damage right there. You're probably dead by that point. And so you can actually aim your shots, which is really cool. So after vehicle combat, you actually get into things like reputation, which is another kind of combat in of its own right. So let's say that you meet somebody that's really cool, Mr. Rico Suave, and all of a sudden he's staring you down. You're going to have a staring contest. You're going to have to compare your reputation to see if you back down or not. It's pretty much how it goes. So there is that. So a nice big section on combat, nice and juicy, lots of information, just what I like in a role-playing game. And then we get to another really cool chapter, which is net running, or as I like to call it, how to hack into things. Narratively speaking, uh, net running works differently in the time of the red. So back in the days of yore, you had access to the net, but then deadly AI constructs took over and to help contain it, basically they just said, oh, to hell with it, and they shut it all down. So no more internet, at least for a while. Then they actually came up with something a little bit different. So in order to actually hack into things, you need to have a cyber deck. And that's going to require you to have interface plugs, which is a cyberware, by the way. And that's going to require you to have a neural link, which is also cyberware. So you're gonna need three things to actually um, hack into things. So there are two different actions that Netrunners can take. They can take meat actions, which are the physical actions, so like physically moving somewhere, that's the meat action. And then they have net actions, which are actions that take place in the net. So depending on what kind of cyber deck you have, there's three of them by the way, will actually determine your uh, how much stuff you can actually use, like programs and stuff. But your interface rank is actually going to determine how many actions you can take while in the net. I found some of this jargon a little bit confusing, especially when it came to uh, the architect or the architecture. So, for example, when you hack into something, you, get, you go into the net architecture for that location. Like, let's say that you're going into a building and you're hacking into something, then you're going to get into the net architecture for that building or that computer or something like that. So then you're going to have different floors and each floor was going to have something different on the other side of the door. And there's also going to be something that might uh, hamper your way. So there might be a certain demon that's going to start attacking you, or you're going to have to use a check to kind of get through some something or to find your way out. And I kind of found that a little bit confusing, mainly because it wasn't a really good visual on, you know, that whole aspect. But it kind of, I mean, creating an architecture is actually quite easy. You just roll some on some tables if you want to do it randomly and stuff like that. And so there's actually all sorts of things to block your players or make things harder to get to the bottom floor, which will give them access to everything, and then they can start doing some really cool stuff like that. So there's actually some really cool things in here. It's just going to take a couple, or it took me a couple read-throughs to actually make any sense of it. So there is that. So we do have access to things like different things that you can actually hack into, like observation cameras and stuff like that, laser grids. And then you also have some demons that you can play around with uh, that actually have stats of their own. So you have imps, ifrits, and balerons, and they all have different uh, things that they do. 
So like demons are things that you can basically use to automate things or stuff like that. I think that's what they do. So all of that is here. Everything you need to know, especially if you're a netrunner in this chapter. Um, just read through it very carefully. That's all I can say. And then we get to another chapter called Trauma Team. Or as I like to call it, getting hurt and crying like a baby. This is the chapter on wounds, critical injuries, and healing. And actually, before today, I would have even questioned why this was a chapter on its own. And then I was actually reading through the Edge of the Empire core rule book, and I was reminded by how much of a nightmare it is to look up even the most basic of information like healing. And then I was really glad that this is its own chapter because, my gosh, I like finding anything in that book is a chore. So the fact that healing and stuff like that is its own chapter right here, that's really good. And that's the kind of organizations organizational layout that I really wish this book had st stuck with instead of just lumping a whole bunch of stuff that was, wasn't really related into one chapter, chapter five. So you have a detail on your wound states. So lightly wounded, seriously wounded, mortally wounded, and then dead. You have, um, op or you have the rules for death saves, which is basically your body stat and you're trying to roll down. So when you're dying, um, the DV is your body save, like I just said. If you roll a 10 on your D10, you automatically fail and you die. Um, if you succeed and nobody stabilizes you on before your next turn, uh, you actually add one to your D10. So it makes it a lot harder to actually roll underneath. And if you fail one death save, even once, you are dead. So yeah, uh, this game is quite brutal like that and I absolutely love it. There's actually mental health options here as well. So you're going to have things like addiction from your street drugs and other things like that. And then you have therapy, which I think is really cool, especially since you are losing humanity every time you take cyber uh, cyberware. So you're going to have therapy for addiction, um, humanity loss, either standard or extreme. And it does take time and it can be quite expensive, but it might be really worth it so you don't... Uh, have any nasty side effects and yeah there are different drugs in here as well and that's actually really cool the way that they work because they actually give you some sort of a benefit and then there's like some sort of side effect that also goes with it and yeah I actually really like this chapter even though it's nice and short and sweet it's everything a chapter actually really should be and then the last thing you get is the rules on cyberpsychosis. So if you actually become a cyberpsycho, then your GM basically takes your character and uh, has some fun with it. Then we get to the next chapter, Welcome to the Dark Future, or as I like to call it, The Time Before the Red. I'm actually not going to go into too much depth about this chapter. All I will say is that this chapter and the next chapter uh, are details of the history of the cyberpunk universe. Uh, this specific chapter, Welcome to the Dark Future, is the time before the red. So this is actually written like a textbook, which I found was really funny, like a history, actual history textbook, which I find really funny. It definitely took me back to my high school days. But you get a nice layout of pertinent events that kind of led up to the time of to the time of the red and so you get things like what's happening around the world in asia in the middle east and stuff like that and how it actually affects the global economy and stuff like that which is really cool i actually really enjoyed reading this um, mainly because i you know i'm playing cyberpunk 2077 i'm really curious as to how we got to that point and so this chapter and the next one are just it's basically written for those people who really love lore. And I'm glad that this was actually included in the book. And then, of course, we have the next chapter, which is the Time of the Red, or as I like to call it, the Time of the Red. And this chapter is the Time of the Red. So any everything that's happening during the Time of the Red, which is 2045, is in this book or in this chapter. And this chapter specifically, I really like because it gives you all of the major corporations, their background, who's actually the head of that corporation. And actually, just take a look at this picture first, by the way. That is actually awesome artwork, especially given that all of these are major figures in corporations, different corporations. 
And so you get all of these different corporations and what they do and how they fit into the universe. And it's really good, especially if you have somebody who's playing an exec or if that you're using a corporation to kind of be the Mr. Johnson that's giving your players uh, assignments and stuff like that. So this section specifically, I really enjoyed like everything in this chapter. I absolutely enjoyed it. And I just soaked it all up and loved it. Took care of it like my little teddy bear when I was five years old. So, then we get to the next chapter, which is Welcome to Night City. Or as I like to call it, everything you need to know about Night City. This is another excellent chapter for those people who really like lore. Although it's not really much about the history of cyberpunk in the world itself. But this is specific to Night City. And so before it was called Morro Bay in, in the 90s and then it started making transitions as this dude right here began to actually shape it into what is now known as Night City. Um, this is just a lot of information about Night City and the different districts that are in Night City, which is probably where a lot of GMs are going to want to go because, I mean... Things are a lot different than 2020 or 2077. This is 2045, so you're not going to have this nice little piece in the middle because that's the part that actually blew up way back in 2020-something. So that area is pretty much gone. It's like all irradiated. So yeah, not only do you get a whole list of the different uh, sections of Night City, but you also get what kind of threats you're going to find in that city specific section. So for example, the overpacked suburbs has a threat rating of moderate in combat, and then you're going to have some actual uh, zones within that section. And so towards the end of this book, um, when we get into the different uh, uh, enemies that you can find, you're also going to get the uh, different threats that are in those regions. And so you have a better detailed map right here, as well as the key places and where they are actually on the map, which is really cool. And then we get to everyday life, or as I like to call it, a bunch of fluff. All that I can really say about this chapter is it gives a lot of fluff information about role playing for your character. Like things like what does your character eat? Um, where do they live? Where do they sleep? It's all here. It's just really nothing gameplay wise that I can really make out. It's just, you know, getting information to better help you role play. So that is pretty cool. I will say though, there is a quite a weird and funny uh, rollable table for what's in the nearest vending machine. So yeah, you could definitely take a look at that yourself. Um, there's some interesting options. And then we get to the New Street Economy, or as I like to call it, the Real Equipment Chapter. So right off the bat, you get a little bit of information about how the economy works and how nomads kind of shaped the economy around Night City. You also get a section on creating night markets. So your fixers, if they're high enough level in the fixer role, they can actually call on a night market in any place and they can actually get some equipment that you probably can't find in your everyday shop. And that's pretty cool because some of the gear might be illegal. You might need some drugs or something or some programs that you just can't buy at your standard shop. You get a lot of repeated information. So this is the chapter that I basically wish that in chapter 5, all that gear stuff just would have been here. And it actually is here with the rollable tables and everything. So that's kind of really why it bothers me so much that it's actually in chapter 5. So you get a lot of the same information here, but you actually get more information. Things that you actually need to know. As well as some more stuff. So like the different kinds of ammunition is actually listed here. Uh, you still get the same exotic uh, weapons, but you actually get more details as to what they actually do. You get a master gear list, which is something you had in the previous chapter, but now you actually get a blurb of what they actually do. And so everything is here from chapter 5, it's just more detailed, which 
I actually much prefer this chapter as opposed to the character creation uh, little blurb and then move on type deal that they had going there. So this <laughs> is actually everything that an equipment chapter needs to be. So basically, if you have Euro bucks and you are looking to spend them, this is the chapter that you're going to want to go to. You have services and entertainment, your lifestyle and your housing, and even how to uh, work. So each of the roles have different ways of working. And I'm really thankful for this chap for this section and the fact that they actually separated by the roles. So let's say that I am a, a med tech. I would go to the med tech and let's say I actually want to work. Depending on my role ability, I would roll my D6 and then I would go to that actual category. And that's how much money I would make for like the week or something like that. And so that's a really cool way to spend your downtime and actually make some money. Because remember, uh, you actually have to pay bills. You actually have to pay for your housing. And that's like a thousand euro bucks, unless you're an exec, uh, per month. So yeah, you actually need to make some money. Then, of course, we get into running cyberpunk, or as I like to call it, the most pertinent information for GMs. This is the chapter for GMs, and basically how to run a game of Cyberpunk Red. Um, one of the most useful bits of information actually isn't anywhere else in this book, and that's a good thing. Um, this is the information on uh, creating nemesis, or uh, what do you call it, adversaries. Uh, so, mooks and grunts. So, here's how it works. Let's say that I'm looking for a something for my low-level characters. Well, bodyguards, booster gangers, and road gangers, and even security operatives are your low-level adversaries, as is mentioned right here. So, in general, a group of player character edge runners should be able to battle an equal number of MOOC NPCs and have a good chance of coming up on top. And so, what I would do is I would take these as a template and just plug them into uh, different adversaries for my characters. And of course, you're going to have some other things that are higher up the chain. So, like your cyber psychos, those are going to be like one of those guys are going to be a pretty big challenge for low level edge runners or PCs. So I would take that as a starting template and then of course I would flesh things out a little bit more, maybe change something here or there. You could of course just go ahead and roll a new character as an NPC, you know, using the street rat method to do it quickly, but I wouldn't really want to spend that much time doing that. I would just go ahead and uh, pick a template, plug it in, and rename it, and do stuff like that. And then, of course, in this chapter, you have the encounters all over Night City. So if you're going to a certain section, these are the encounters that you might find, as well as their threats. So really good chapter. Uh, th I think this is the best information in this whole entire chapter. And of course... In this chapter for GMs, you all actually do get things like um, what if my characters are racing or what if we're doing a duel. So you do get optional rules that you can use. But to me, this specific section is where I would gain the most information. Especially because um, for me, this is actually a new... Not only is it a new genre, but it's a new system. So I'm not quite sure how things scale with PCs, but that section actually tells you pretty well um, how to scale things and what the scaling is. And then the last part of this chapter is actually what they call scream sheets, which are kind of like adventure starters. So there's not really a full-blown adventure in the core rulebook like there are in some other core systems. Um, so they actually just give you like adventure starters in the form of these little news uh, pages right here. And on the back, it gives you player information and what the GM needs to know. And so they're just starters. I don't really know how I would feel about that, but it is what it is. And then, of course, we get the last chapter, which is the Black Dog. And this is the last story. Uh, this story right here... Uh, is trying to emulate what a cyberpunk red adventure could be like as opposed to the other stories before this which were just about the lore 
So this one isn't so heavy on the lore, in my opinion. It's just, you know, a nice little adventure for to get you ready to play Red. That's all that I would equate it to. And then, of course, you have your character sheets. And the last thing is the index, which I'm so thankful for that the index is the last thing because now I don't have to flip through some pages to actually get to an index. So that's actually really good. So my final thoughts, Cyberpunk Red is an interesting system that is really in its own niche category. So for example, you have, you have games like Shadowrun, which implement tech and magic. And then there's Dancing with Bullets Under Neon Sun, which is something for people who want something that's a little bit more light on rules. And soon there's actually going to be Crystal Punk, which is basically Cyberpunk using the 5e rule set. But that's kind of all there really is. I mean, you could play Cyberpunk 2020. I mean, that's a thing that you can do. Um, but that's kind of all there is. And Red does what it does quite well. It offers a complex rule set for those who are looking for crunch and complexity. And that's really good. I, I really do enjoy that. My gripe with this book, though, are just the layout options like having information during character creation and then that same information towards the end of the book in the chapters that it actually belongs in that just really baffles me i would just prefer if it was just one chapter with all the information that i need right there so i'm not having to go back and forth uh, or if i'm a new player then i can see everything up front without having without like having the book hide it from me at the onset because then you know some of those abilities I might actually want based on their later roles, like the later levels that you get. With that being said, I do really appreciate that this book does a really good job at pointing you back to those information bits with page numbers. Um, without that, this book would be an absolute nightmare. Like, let me tell you. But it's only because they actually reference those page numbers that I can actually just go to that page number for that information and then go right back to where I was. So for that, that actually brings that, kind of makes those faults right in a way. Some of the more complex mechanics might take more than one read through. For me, it was net running. But then again, the same could also be said of any other system. And I think the way I think the reason why net running was just a little bit different for me was because I've never been exposed to a tech heavy game like this. Like yeah, I I play I GM Star Wars, but Star Wars is uh, hacking, if you could call it that. Slicing uh, mechanic is quite simple as opposed to what's here, and so I think over time and over practice, uh, it would definitely make more sense to me. I would actually highly recommend this system for any cyberpunk style game. And in fact, it doesn't even have to be in Night City. Like, I can see me totally pulling this off, like, in a hard sci-fi setting, like, space setting. It could definitely work for that. And even if you wanted to do it in Cyberpunk 2020, you could totally do that. You would just take some of the extra... Uh, books, supplements that were made for 2020 and just use these mechanics there. But you would have to narratively change how net running works because net running um, in the time of the red is vastly different than 2020 or so I've heard. It's up to you and some people have their flavors and some people really like it that way. So that is actually going to be it for this review. Feel free to leave a comment down below. Check the description for my two characters that I made for this system, which are in other videos as well. And feel free to give this video a huge thumbs up to support the series, and I will see you guys in the next video.